Good morning, Art History 2 class. I hope you're doing fantastically well. Greeting from one of the most beautiful cities in the world, Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Can you believe 300 years if we went back, half the land that you're currently looking at would actually be underwater and it would still be underwater today with sea level rise. One of the amazing things that happens is that the Dutch took their power status. Have you ever heard of the East Dutch India Company, one of the most powerful, likely the most powerful company the world has ever seen, parlayed their money into land reclamation products and brought back about 30% of the land that shows up in the current Netherlands. The artists that we're gonna be talking about are from the what's called the Dutch Golden Age, um, also nor known as Northern Baroque art, and they date from about 1600 to 1700. You'll note we have our Italian Baroque, which we saw last time in Bernini, and note the Caravaggio. We're gonna have a fair amount of Northern style at Tenebras and we looked at, but remember, Caravaggio is from Italy, northern part of Italy, and so really not from the northern Baroque, even though pieces of his style are going to carry over. Now, the artist that we want to start off with from the Dutch Golden Age is arguably the greatest portrait painter that has ever lived. So if you are interested in portrait painting, and that's what you're here studying um, in college, I highly recommend you go back and you look at the portraits of Rembrandt and Ryn from 1606 to 1669, he is absolutely the master of the Dutch Golden Age. And that is because not just for the detail, the empirical quality, um, the tiny little fractions of trying to get a soul of a sitter, but he actually puts the sitter in interesting scenarios, often what they're doing. Probably you have all had that terrible soccer portrait where you sit there and the one kid in the front gets to stand on the ball, one kid lays out and the rest of you just stand there rigidly and you never go back to look at it because it's not interesting at all. You go back maybe three times in your life and see it and you're like, why did I actually ever have that picture? Like it's cute because I see my friend if your best friend is in it, but that's the only reason why because they're not interesting. Um, and so for those of you that are taking classes like in Jennifer Basile's figure drawing class. One of the assignments I know she makes you do is go out and try to depict yourself in multiple different ways. Think about how Rembrandt does it and then go forth and conquer. He's the best artist for setting this up. So before we get started then, I specifically want to show you a video that talks about the rise and why Dutch Northern Baroque or you know, the Dutch Golden Age is different than any other part of Europe. And there are really three reasons this why is what Dutch that the video art goes the 17th through. century looks like small, finely crafted paintings, often depicting the simple things in life, the home, town, country, and people from all walks of life. They are so realistic that you can almost smell the flowers, feel the fabrics, taste the oysters, and watch the caterpillars crawl right out of the frame. Even now, Rembrandt's intense eyes, Vermeer's quiet interiors, and the riot of blooms in a classic Dutch still life excite and inspire. So what makes Dutch art from this time so special? What made it a golden age? In other parts of Europe, paintings were generally very grand and a bit more ostentatious. Artists mostly painted dramatic religious scenes or, or glorified the king in flamboyant portraits. Art from the Dutch Republic was different for three reasons. The first is politics. The Dutch had broken away from their Spanish rulers to form a republic in the northern provinces of the Netherlands. For the first time, art collecting was largely in the hands of wealthy middle-class citizens who were less interested in seeing pictures of kings and more interested in portraits of textile traders, doctors or artists. And this also explains why ordinary people doing ordinary things could all of a sudden be a subject in art. The second reason is religion. Unlike its Catholic neighbours, the Dutch Republic was Protestant and images were forbidden inside its churches. So artists began making more secular pictures with subjects like the backyard or pouting kids. But they were still deeply pious people, so often their paintings were filled with spiritual meaning, like contemplating scripture or one's own impending doom. The third reason that art from the Dutch Republic was different is all about money, isn't it always? Over the course of the 17th century, the Dutch led lucrative expeditions to Asia, even bumping into Australia a few times. Soon they dominated international trade, becoming one of the richest and most powerful countries in the world. 
Wealthy traders wanted pictures of their adventures on the high seas, their foreign trading posts, the CEOs, and the loot. With so much extra cash around, more people could buy art for their homes and offices. And so Europe's first competitive art market was born, producing some of history's most brilliant painters. They set themselves apart by becoming technical masters of one particular subject. Winter landscapes, river landscapes, this city really landscapes, genre landscapes, painting. Cows, They're all going to have their own genre. Paper, dead rabbits, culture, you name it, there was a brilliant Dutch artist who specialised in it. And then there's Rembrandt, who was good at everything. So there it is, a wealthy Protestant independent people who loved pictures. The magic combination for a golden age of art. That really is a fantastic introduction then into the Dutch golden age and why it is different than other yes. individuals. And the individuals that actually are going to lead this Dutch golden age largely are going to be Vermeer, but specifically Rembrandt in the Netherlands. And that's why I'm actually here in Amsterdam. Um, and then Rubens, who's going to be Flemish. But Flemish, you'll note, is right here. And so there's still a considerable control um, that shows up from the, um, the kings and queens of Spain. So they live right on the edge. And so Rubens still does a lot of his work in Protestant style, but also does a fair amount in Roman Catholics. So he's one that combines both styles and basically can paint anywhere in Europe. Now, Rembrandt, as you can see over here, for those of you that are portrait painters or want to be portrait painters, he's the master portrait painter, particularly because of doing group and actions together. And so this particular artwork is one of his most famous. It's Captain Franz Banning Kock mustering his troop. It's also known as the Night Watch. Now, Rembrandt never meant it to, never wanted to be meant as the Night Watch. It is darkened over time with the materials and the smoke that is actually hidden. It was actually meant to be a twilight, literally very similar to the lighting conditions that I would have today. So if you look through this particular artwork, what do you see that's different in terms of a portrait? All right, there's multiple individuals. Note, they're not just staring at you. In fact, very few of them ever look at you. The way that you would actually get a prominent position in a Rembrandt artwork then is that in a, in a group portrait, generally there would be a set price. But if you wanted to move up or be highlighted or have a different color, you would pay Rembrandt a little bit more money and he would actually accentuate your position and move you forward within the process. So what makes this remarkable is that this group portraiture this is all about a company that's basically on the night watch, the company that's going to protect you, your police force. And so what's amazing, if you look around, they're all doing exactly what they should be doing. They're preparing to make sure that they are ready to fight, that their guns all work. So if you look around the painting there, notice here, he's loading the musket. Um, and so you'll see individuals doing multiple different things, checking the flint, making sure that they have the light, and so you're looking at every aspect as they're ready to go with this beautiful golden light, um, this very empirical study of everything that happens to be there. You'll also note the same thing in the anatomy lesson of Dr. Told. Anatomy, remember, was outlawed up until very recently. And so if you look at the detail, they're literally looking and starting to dissect, dissect the individual. Look how interested this particular student, this individual looks out at us, as does this individual, and both stand and highlight then with the triangular composition when they developed by Leonardo da Vinci. And note at the very pinnacle of that triangle composition is the medical certificate showing you that Dr. Tolp is licensed to do this type of work. So this is really a medical school working on a cadaver where again, if you want yourself to be prominent or want to look out, you would pay Rembrandt Van Rijn a little bit extra and he would actually put that in you. So pretty remarkable portraiture. The other thing that's remarkable about Rembrandt is the idea of the lighting techniques that show up besides the group portraiture. His is one of the most common forms of lighting that we use, even use in Hollywood, as this video shows. Did you know that the most famous lighting technique used in Hollywood films and portrait photography was actually created about 400 years ago by a Dutch painter? I'm Maris from the A-Team, and today we're going to be going over the history of this lighting technique and how you can recreate it using just one light. During the 17th century, Baroque art rules Europe and extravagance was all the rage. It's not hard to imagine the stereotypical grandiose imagery associated with paintings from this era. But during this time period, there was a man named Rembrandt van Rijn, and he decided to take a 180 from all of these lavishly vibrant art styles. Many scholars see him as the antithesis of the Baroque era, 
a 17th century rebel without a cause. Or was he? Though he was an incredibly successful artist during his teens and 20s, Rembrandt sadly faced many tragedies. His children died and his wife Saskia died shortly after at the age of 29. After all these tragedies, Rembrandt's paintings took a dark turn. His artistic style became dark. Less to the neighbors and coming out of Caravaggio. So, now that I've successfully ruined your day with this very, very sad story, let's get on to what this has to do with Hollywood films. Rembrandt went down in history as one of the greatest visual artists of all time. He was one of the very first masters of light with his paintings, and his signature technique is characterized by a little triangle right below his subject's eye. This is known as the Rembrandt Triangle, and pretty much every single movie poster has it, from Pirates of the Caribbean to The Godfather. In addition to movie posters, pretty much every famous celebrity has at least one portrait that's split in the style of this famous Rembrandt technique. The lighting technique is used frequently in emotional scenes in movies, showing when a character is going through a very intense change. It's also been replicated millions, yes, millions of times in portraits. So to replicate this look, you really only need one light. Lift the light above your subject and angle it to one side of them by about 50 or 60 degrees until you see that famous triangle. If you want to replicate the look faithfully, use a fairly hard light source in a room with darker ambience, and use a lot of negative fill. Resist the urge to make this pretty. So there you have it. That's how one Dutch painter affected pretty much every movie and portrait ever. But now let's open this up to you. Did you know? And so here you can actually see that Rembrandt talking. Um, so I would slightly disagree with the video only in the fact that I think you need to have a key light, which is exactly what he said, 45 to 50 degrees over here. But you generally have to have a little bit of a fill light, a small light over here. You can even put actually something like tin foil or a reflective surface here that will actually provide a little bit of that fill light that will fill up as long as it doesn't stay in the camera line. But that's ultimately how you get that triangle. And we generally use it all the time. It's wonderful because it does show this dark foreshadowing, right? We have a light side and a dark side. So it really does give an indication of the humanity of each individual, that depending on how you turn towards or away from the light, you're turning towards, towards goodness or away from goodness, um, or turning f um, towards the evil and the darkness or away from it. And this is something that the light does fantastically well. And so the question that shows up is that, is Rembrandt our first selfie artist? Because he is the first artist that we can actually look at that does multiple images of them themselves. Rembrandt is not about beauty, but Rembrandt is about the raw truth. And that is the interesting concept that we talk about when we look at Rembrandt as the first self, selfie artist. Because the idea is the selfie about beauty, or is it actually about truth? And for the vast majority of, of course, it's about beauty. We want to have wonderful, lovely images or strange images of ourselves and the difference. So the question that comes up, of course, as we look at this, is what is the difference between a portrait or a self-portrait and a selfie? We can actually see that in the video that I'll play here for you. As you think about the, think about the artists that are showing up. Here are some of the most famous artists. These are all the different self-portraits then that show up with Rembrandt. Are these self-portraits or are these selfies in the modern day world? You can see the change over time of his age as well and his physical condition. And so this does lead us to the question below. What is the difference between a self-portrait and a selfie? Is there a difference in the modern day world or was Rembrandt so far ahead that even though he did not know the technology that was coming, that he kind of predicts on some of where we're going when anyone can create that artwork. And the other thing then, is the selfie actually an art form? Are all selfies art forms? Because mostly it's a mechanical reproduction. Yes, you choose the style and the angle, but this is the same information, the same problem they're gonna have when photography comes along. 
um, it's so easy to take is that every selfie an art. And so, you know, to play off this, of course, is the most famous. And wow, I hate to admit this. I love this song, but I hate this song because it talks about the self-indulgent indulgent nature sometimes of what a selfie is. But remember, a selfie does not have to be self-indulgent. Um, a selfie does not have to be about beauty and putting yourself out there in the world. We've considered that along the lines of what Rembrandt had done. But here's a video and then we'll watch how artists have done basically versions of selfies. And I have to admit, I love this song even though it bothers me after listening to it. And the question, of course, then we ask, is this art or just self-indulgent fantasy? Maybe this is an odd one to choose within that process. But the entire idea shows up that what is the nature of when we take these selfies and self-portraits? What is the actual difference? So here's the conversation we have in class on it. And so the last video I want to show you actually along this line is you think about self-portrait or selfie. Here are selfies or self-portraits that were done by very famous artists. So you'll know there's Chuck Close, Frida Kahlo, Van Gogh, um, Vermeer. I mean, there's another Van Gogh. It's pretty remarkable how many artists have actually done this over time. The question, are they exploring identity? Are they talking about their gender role? Are they trying to create beauty? Are they exploring a new artistic technique? Are they trying to show their inside mental capacity? What is it that makes the difference between a selfie, which we consider throwaway, um, and the idea of an actual self-portrait? Judith Leister is also from the Dutch Golden Age. Female painters were allowed during that time period as well and accepted. And that is really it. Is it the difference between a self-portrait and a selfie? What we're trying to attempt is it about beauty, is it about internal desires, it is about um, learning something about ourselves. That's ultimately what we're trying to look at when we talk about the difference. Now, as we look at Rembrandt then, from the Amsterdam kind of area up here, and kind of very much where the Dutch had already had complete independence now from the Spanish after numerous wars and established the East India Trading Company money flowing in that's happening in the Rubens Flemish area as well, 
this more green area right here, and then still be works for the Spanish king. Um, Rembrandt is the idea of the self-portrait, the idea of um, group portraiture, and that fantastic at Rembrandt triangular lighting, which is not that hard to achieve, but gives you a sensibility of kind of the, the duality of mankind in our choices. Rubens then is going to be a rock star, and he's going to be the rock star of the golden age. Um, not necessarily, and not only because of his talent, but because that he can actually work anywhere in Europe. He is fascinated with female imagery, particularly imagery of mothers. And that is because he is deeply ashamed that his father, who is a well-known individual, is caught with adultery. And it's a huge scandal within his town. And it brings down kind of his family and his family structure. He's going to invent what's called the first international style, which you'll be studying here in a moment, which is really a combination of Northern and Southern Baroque styles together. So everything you learn from Bernini all the way up through Rembrandt. He is knighted by Philip the fourth of Spain and by Charles the first of England. So a Roman Catholic and an Anglican. And these two individuals do not get along very well. He's the peacemaker between the Catholic and the Protestant wars. And he lives during a very tumultuous time period. He has the most successful art studio ever, all the way up today, commercially successful. He is the first great landscape painter at the same time. And he loved pleasure and he was more than happy to show it. And later on, he's going to be despised by later artists. Picasso and Ang, and Ang both say he makes nasty things. Here's his Rubens house in Antwerp. So this is his house and studio. Here's this, an image over um, Antwerp and his studio is right over here, not far from that particular cathedral. You can see he kind of lives the rock style mansion type of um, house and life. Now, if you look at these two images, Charles I of England from 1632, this is by Rubens and by one of his students, Anthony Van Dyck, who's also a later very famous um, Dutch Golden Age painter. If you ever take a, a Dutch Golden Age, you'll spend at least an entire day um, studying Van Dyck. They basically were talking diplomacy and peace negotiation while he was painting the kingly portrait. <clears throat> so imagine the technique and the amazing nature of just the skill level here. You are negotiating the end of wars between Protestants, Anglicans, um, Catholics throughout Europe. And at the same time, you're drawing and painting. So you really have concentrated, high-end concentration on two different levels. Really a remarkable skill. It's one of the reasons that he was knighted by both Spain and by England. He's also the greatest landscape painter of his generation, uh, showing the far-reaching depths and details. So we talked about, uh, during the Renaissance, the picture window and chiaroscuro, one-point perspective, and atmospheric perspective, trompe l'oeil. Rubens is that first person who actually is able to use that in landscape, in long vistas of landscape. Remember, it looked like the made-up landscape, even in Mona Lisa, by Leonardo da Vinci. And here it's a convincing landscape that we see all the way in the background. Thank you, President um, Trump. And so President Trump now joins our list of presidents who have been announced our lovely 100 artworks. We've also seen President, former President Bill Clinton, former President um, Obama, both have done it. And um, Donald Trump then just introduced us to one of the greatest artworks of all time. It's a Rubens. It's called The Raising of the Cross from 1610 or 1611. It is an altarpiece. I know in the video earlier, it said that in Protestant, we generally didn't allow too many large scale artworks or visceral artworks to show up because it was more about our relationship with God. And so this is clearly going to be in a Roman Catholic church. Remember, Rubens actually live, works and lives in the fringe between the Dutch and the Spanish, the Protestant and the Roman Catholic. So he goes back and forth between those two. So here's what I'd like you to do. In class, we're going to do this. I want you to look through this and actually try to figure out, this is called the first international style. It's invented by Rubens, which basically he's going to take all the best ideas from art and he's going to put them all together in one image. And so I would like you to go back, think about it from the very beginning of class. It's a great review for the midterm or for the final exam is the idea is, what is Rubens here taking from Van Eyck? What are the ideas, the concepts? What about from Donatello? What about from Masaccio? What about from Brunelleschi? 
Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Raphael, Bernini, Caravaggio, and Rembrandt. What is he taking from all these different artists and actually putting together to create such a wonderful first international style of picture that's acceptable no matter where you go in Europe? And I'll let you pause the video here and I'll go on and we'll walk through a little bit. All right, so from Van Eyck. From Van Eyck, he's taking that symbolism. The idea, if you look around, here we have a dog, very close, like loyal to the master. Look at the horse over here. The, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, if you know that story, coming for destruction in the last judgment. It's got rabies almost. You can see the spit. So look how wild and out of control versus how controlled this particular individual and this dog is for that idea. For Donatello, we have the idea of the reinvention of the classical figure, particularly with these beautiful contrapposto curves that are going to show up. Masaccio, we have the three-dimensional forms that are showing up, but we have the heroic bottles that are going to come out of Michelangelo with their wrist ripped musculature. From Masaccio, we also have an outside light source, right? That light source really is coming from the divine heavens and does not make sense in a real world setting. From Leonardo, we have the beautiful study of anatomy, also the empirical detail of getting everything right. That also comes out of Van Eyck. From Raphael, the color palette, these very brights that show up. I should mention that brights is actually really emphasized by Leonardo, the use specifically here of chiaroscuro, that shading from light to dark, particularly in Jesus's image to make it almost glow with oil paint, of course, perfected by Van Eyck. From Bernini, we have that theatrical, over the top, kind of aspect that shows up that this is a drama city. This is not what it would have really looked like. There's no blood, there's no gore when we have this diagonal composition. Note the triangular composition as well, also coming out of Leonardo. From Caravaggio, we have that dark tenebrism that shows up in different aspects, particularly where the figure of the old Jewish man that's the tree almost disappears. And from Rembrandt, we have that beautiful note, Rembrandt lighting that shows up right there. You see it. And so particularly note, it shows up only on a few figures that are highlighted. And there's a reason behind that within the messages we'll see. So the question for all of you then is to think about the message here. This is one of the most important artworks in art history too, because of the concept and of the message that shows up behind it. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to try to figure out what is the message that carries on into so many of their artworks that it's the first time that we ever see here. And you could pause this video and we'll go on. And that is right. It is the battle of good versus evil. Here, if we go back, the good versus evil. Now we know. Note, we've got this pointy ear and no nose. This was one of the models that they actually used initially when they were planning Voldemort. They were looking for other art, other art inspirations. And so Rubens was one of them. They actually used this hulky, muscular figure. But no, Voldemort doesn't have a muscular figure. This basically can be seen as a signification of Satan himself. This idea of this massive overarching, so the power versus good here. Look how hard it is for him to raise up the goodness that here because he's struggling with the evil. So who does he have helping him? Well, the people that actually helped destroy Christ from this time period's perspective. The Jewish individuals that actually brought him in for being someone who was a blasphemer. The Muslims from the area because anytime we have uh, people that we want to blame, as we've seen with St. Peter from Caravaggio, all the way back to the Crusades, the Muslims are going to get blamed, or the Arabs. Um, back then, they are synonymous. They are not, as I mentioned before. And finally, the Roman centurions, all pulling up, literally, they basically looked at all these powerful men trying to raise up Jesus onto the cross for the crucifixion, for it to begin. Of course, God's not happy. We see that. Look at how we have dark clouds that start to form over here. So God is really not happy with this. Then we even have the torture that shows up. Note, it's the same figure as before, right here. And so we have the staff of long giants that's about to poke um, Jesus to make that mark on the inside that we're going to have. And also they're putting the crown of thorns on, which is just more punishment for someone who's about to be crucified. There's no reason for that at all, except to cause more pain. Over here, we have the innocent, the Virgin Mary, Mary Magdalene, literally trying to fight it off. Lovely saints who look on that can't believe the torture that's undergoing here. So this is that battle of good versus evil. First time we've ever seen it in art. 
And then we see it all over, whether it's Star Wars, whether it's Marvel's Avengers, it's kind of the most common form in almost, almost all of our art form outside of love today. This one, no surprise what the message this is. This is the consequences of war. Remember, Rubens is that great peacekeeper. So this is many years later from 1637 to 38. And note how the colors flow and blend in this beautiful, almost kind of rambling, lovely precursor to romanticism that we're going to see in a couple of weeks. And the whole idea here is that he's just starting to mix turpentine with this paint. So mixing it with oil paint. So you get this beautiful flow, this blending, but almost this haze that shows up that allows you to create basically demon monsters emerging out of hell and out of the darkness, the tenebrous darkness. Now, this is really the idea of the consequences of war, if you look at it. Where over here, we have all these wonderful things that are left if you don't go to war. And yet all these things are going to get destroyed if you actually follow the aspect of war. And of course, this is Mars, the war god. He's looking back lovingly. But Cupid and Venus, the love goddess and his family, Europa and trying to keep it safe, they're not going to keep him there. Because look at the power of fury, electo, anger, drawing him forth within the process. When he does, they're going to destroy books. They're going to destroy harmony with the broken loot. They're going to destroy procreation and charity, potentially even the Virgin Mary, Christianity itself. Remember, these are the wars of, of Christians on Christians, Protestants versus um, Roman Catholics. Architecture is going to get to what's going to be the cause disease and famine. So these are the consequences of war, about 30 years of war that took place during a lot of Rembrandt, uh, during a lot of Rubens' life, which he's actually helped, able to help start to negotiate peace treaties that end this. And so even the Temple of Janus, Janus it means two-headed, it's the open door which shows you war. It could be closed and beautiful and services. You could be there with your beautiful wife. So here we have, you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, Men, that idea of Aries, Mars going on, women wanting love and children and family wanting to pull back with that beautiful diagonal composition. Note the arm also comes across here, the very phallic symbol of Mars coming right out of the crotch here. That's about the stab harmony, really right in the head, almost kind of annihilating her as well. And eventually will strike down procreation and charity. So this masculine endeavor. Rubens is also hired then by some of the, the most powerful families in all of Europe. And this is the Marie de Medici. Again, Medici as queen. We saw the Medici family, what they did during the Renaissance. They are still owning the banks and still ruling a good portion of um, France, of Spain, of England. They have become the kings and queens of other parts of the world, mostly queens through marriage. And so here you see her as the queen of France. This was literally made her, or this was the idea of trying to celebrate the Medici coming in, that this new queen was coming in to start a reign of kind of renaissance, even in the later date, right? That the wars would supposedly end and individuals would come and they would just worship, including the gods. So when Marie de Medici disembarks from the boat into France, look, even the three um, water nymphs beside him himself comes up to praise that Marie de Medici has made a safe passage. So even the gods are protecting her in kind of a neo-Platonic Christian thought that the pagan and Christians are all welcoming her in from one Roman Catholic Italy to another Roman Catholic state, France, and the promotion of the Roman, class, uh, the, the Roman Catholic kind of mission of world salvation. Now, later on, that's going to be a problem. Because what Rubens likes, and remember, he likes different things, and he likes pleasures of the flesh. He enjoys sex, and he's one of the first individuals, one of the first artists that's not afraid to deal with it. And so later on, we're going to have this definition of Rubens, who liked larger women, women with some fat on them. And so Rubenesque comes to being today, definition of larger size women, was coined 200 years after Rubens' death. That's basically a fat girl insult. And so basically we have these beautiful three glaces. Note the slender feature coming out of the Aphrodite of Canaan. But note, she has some fat on her too. These women have a little bit more. And so the idea here is that, and even here, it becomes interesting. His own wife is one of his models that he actually depicts. And so you'll see this in a number of Rubens' images. So the question becomes, is this eroticism, or is he actually making a reference that small-sized women 
are a little bit on the weaker side, right? Women have a little bit more fat, also probably have a little bit more muscle. It's not just about muscle definition and tone, it really is about power. So this is about, so is this from your perspective, the idea of an eroticism based upon women who are normal looking women, which we very much want to pride in and, and talk about wonderfully in the modern day world, that they're not all stick figures like they very much appear to be in the Botticelli, this beautiful um, image from La Primavera. Or is it the idea that you have small size weakness? And we have people on both sides of that argument. The Rubenists, the people who actually are gonna follow Rubens then with that first international movement across the top are going to focus on color. And then we're going to have Poussinists coming from uh, an artist named Nicolas Poussin, Poussin, P-O-U-S-S-I-N, who basically emphasizes drawing. We are going to see the battle between color and drawing now for the rest of our history. So in our next phase, once we leave this particular art movement, we are going to move our next major art movement. We have a little side note before this, but the next major art movement after Rococo is literally going to be the idea where we are going to emphasize these beautiful neoclassical, these classical, it's going to be called neoclassicism. After that, we're going to go into a romantic period in the 18th century, like Goya, where we're going to emphasize the idea of color that shows up. So Rubens and Poussin are really fighting for control of the future of the art market. So Poussin, you'll note here, so this is St. John on Patmos. This is probably his most famous by Nicolas Poussin from 1640. Renaissance artist born, in, so basically if you look at this, this looks like it's a Renaissance artist, right? The idea of classicism, empiricism, humanism. But he calls these images vendutas, which basically means view. And so he talks about art being a grand manner in a very Renaissance style. He just lives 100 years too late. The grand manner consists of subject matter or theme, thought, structure, and style. The first thing is the foundation shall be grand, like classical art, as are battles, heroic actions, divine things. Arrangement means the relative position of the parts. Measure refers to their size, and form consists of lines and colors. The idea of a highly organized, highly structured, very simple design based upon either divine Christianity or going back to the ancient heroic battles and, and gods and what took place back then. He basically wants to reinvent the Renaissance. And in neoclassicism, we're going to pick up on Poussin and move forward. But note how radically different this is then when we look at St. John from Patmos and the organization versus the more chaotic movements that show up with the Rubens. And so that's what we're looking at. The other famous individual that comes up with this very linear style um, that actually emerges in France, beside Poussin, is another one called Claude Lorraine. And you could note the same features. Beautiful vendudas, the beautiful um, looks that show up, beautiful details, very much from the northern Dutch, kind of borrowing that idea of detail. But it literally is, this is the embarkation of the Queen of Sheba. So again, dealing with historical remnants. So this is by Claude Lorraine. And this also is another version of then of a different style of Baroque art developing. So we have multiple styles. We've got the Bernini style in South, which is counter-reformation art. We've got the Caravaggio dark tenebrism spot, right? Because we have the breakdown of the Roman Catholic Church. And so different areas of Europe are promoting different things. This is an 18th century. This is actually a Claude Glass so it's based upon Claude Baron here. You can see the yellow for the yellow. It's a slightly convex tinted lens. So when you take a picture or when you actually look through someone in your lovely Claude glass, it makes the individual and or it makes the, the landscape much more beautiful and lines up and gives you linear composition much more so than your actual eyesight. So it's a way of beautifying, creating a view even of your everyday experience. Now, Rubens is not out of the woods. We talked about him being one of the most famous art artists during the time period. And so here are critiques of Rubens later on in life. We can make fun of some of these critiques because let's face it, um, not all of them are accurate. What they were actually critiquing is that Rubens liked the larger, more voluptuous, and a woman with some fat on her body. And so they thought of these things as vulgar, right? It's not the way a woman should look. Go all the way back to the Aphrodite Canidos. She should be in shape, curvilinear, beautiful. We don't need fat flowing everyone. And so here's Thomas Aikens, who does wonderful images, realist images later on. He says, Rubens is the nastiest, most vulgar painter that ever lived. 
Look at Picasso. Now note, this is an image of prostitutes that uses African masks because he's afraid of getting venereal disease. So he's terrified of women, even though he wants to sexually still be with them. He's gifted, but he has used his gifts to make nasty things. That's Picasso, and this is his depiction of women. So we have to take that with a grain of salt. Sir William Blake, a very famous romantic later on that we'll see. To my eye, Rubens' coloring is contemptible. His shadows are the color of excrement. He's talking about how the shadows in Rubens, his browns, even when they're in nature, are the color of poop. And exaggeration is not art, but propaganda is what Ang says. Again, exaggeration is not art, but propaganda. The exaggeration that shows up here. Ang is going to be a great exaggerator during the Romantic period as well. Um, so we do have to take some of these critiques because they were actually talking about that they do not want to see the larger female body. So, and that really is what must have much of a critique comes up with this idea of Rubenes women. And so the question for all of us, does Northern Baroque art, what we've looked at from, specifically from Rembrandt, we also saw an image from Vermeer, which we'll, we'll go over in a moment. Does Northern Baroque art share Baroque counter-reformations art aesthetics? So do we have idealized bodies? Is it based upon movement? Is it based upon audience involvement? Is it emotional humanism? Do they have a lot of Christian symbols? And is it theatrical? What of those ones actually carry over between counter-reformation Italian Southern Baroque art and Protestant art or art that is more of the Dutch golden age about anything? You know, it can be about food. It can be about still life, that genre painting that we saw. So that's up for you to figure out and a very good midterm question to know. So the last image that I want to show you is one of the most famous images which we haven't covered yet from the Dutch Golden Age. This is Vermeer's Girl with a Pearl Earring. Is she turning towards you or away from you? No one can agree. She's the mysterious subject of Dutch master Jan Vermeer's Girl with a Pearl Earring, a painting often referred to as the Mona Lisa of the North. Belonging to a Dutch style of idealized, sometimes overly expressive paintings known as tronies, the girl with the pearl earring has the allure and subtlety characteristic of Vermeer's work. But this painting stands apart from the quiet narrative scenes that we observe from afar in many of Vermeer's paintings. A girl reading a letter, a piano lesson, a portrait artist at work. These paintings give us a sense of intimacy while retaining their distance. A drawn curtain often emphasizes this separation. We can witness a milkmaid serenely pouring a bowl of milk, but that milk isn't for us. We're only onlookers. The studied composition in Vermeer's paintings invokes a balanced harmony. With the checkered floor in many of his works, Vermeer demonstrates his command of perspective and foreshortening. That's a technique that uses distortion to give the illusion of an object receding into the distance. Other elements like sight lines, mirrors, and light sources describe the moment through space and position. The woman reading a letter by an open window is precisely placed so the window can reflect her image back to the viewer. Vermeer would even hide the leg of an easel for the sake of composition. The absence of these very elements brings the girl with the pearl earring to life. Vermeer's treatment of light and shadow, or chiaroscuro, uses a dark, flat background to further spotlight her three-dimensionality. Instead of being like a set piece in a theatrical narrative scene, she becomes a psychological subject. Her eye contact and slightly parted lips, as if she is about to say something, draw us into her gaze. Traditional subjects of portraiture were often nobility or religious figures. So why was Vermeer painting an anonymous girl? In the 17th century, the city of Delft, like the Netherlands in general, had turned against ruling aristocracy and the Catholic Church. After eight decades of rebellion against Spanish power, the Dutch came to favor the idea of self-rule and a political republic. Cities like Delft were unsupervised by kings or bishops, so many artists like Vermeer were left without traditional patrons. Fortunately, business innovation, spearheaded by the Dutch East India Company, transformed the economic landscape in the Netherlands. It created a merchant class and new type of patron. 
Wishing to be represented in the paintings they financed, these merchants preferred middle-class subjects depicted in spaces that looked like their own homes, surrounded by familiar objects. The maps that appear in Vermeer's paintings, for example, were considered fashionable and worldly by the merchant class of what is known as the Dutch Golden Age. The oriental turban worn by the girl with the pearl earring also emphasizes the worldliness of the merchant class. And the pearl itself, a symbol of wealth, is actually an exaggeration. Vermeer couldn't have afforded a real pearl of its size. It was likely just a glass or tin drop varnished to look like a pearl. This mirage of wealth is mirrored in the painting itself. In greater context, the pearl appears round and heavy, but a detailed view shows that it's just a floating smudge of paint. Upon close inspection, we are reminded of Vermeer's power as an illusion maker. While we may never know the real identity of the girl with the pearl earring, we can engage with her portrait in a way that is unforgettable. As she hangs in her permanent home in the Mauritz House Museum in The Hague, her presence is simultaneously penetrating and subtle. In her enigmatic way, she represents the birth of a modern perspective on economics, politics, and love. And so another one of the um, things to consider, and one of the questions that shows up, well, you should have an answer for as we're looking through the Dutch Golden Age, um, as well as actually all the Baroque art that really, really runs from 1600 to 1700, whether it's a Rubens, a Bernini, a Caravaggio, a Rembrandt, a Vermeer, a Gentileschi, um, which artwork is the best representation of all of Baroque art and thought? Now that you've seen there's multiple different styles, which artwork is that best representation that actually covers the most aspects of all of Baroque art? And that's something that you should probably look at and think of. You probably think through the process. It most likely probably has to be a Rubens, right? Rubens, um, as he goes through, is trying to create the first international style, that style of artwork that is um, a combination of what's going on in the north, the south, the middle area, and you see all different elements. Remember, as we talked about the first international style, why that comes up. So that is a, a question to consider for each time period, but specifically here when we talk about Baroque. And that will end our Bordeaux presentation. I hope everything is going very well for you. Our last presentation then on the Baroque will be on Baroque music and how that ties in, particularly in the North. Um, and then we, that will actually lead us into our next art movie, Rococo. Have a wonderful day. Bye.